we apprehend a demand of this kind in its broader context and view it as it appears at the stage which self-conscious spirit has presently reached, it's clear that spirit has now got beyond the substantial life it formerly led in the element of thought, that it is beyond the immediacy of faith, beyond the satisfaction and security of the certainty that consciousness then had, of its reconciliation with the essential being, and of that being's universal presence both within and without. It has not only gone beyond all this into the other extreme of an insubstantial reflection of itself into itself, but it also beyond that too. Spirit has not only lost its essential life, it is also conscious of this loss and of the finitude that is its own content. Turning away from the empty husks and confessing that it lies in wickedness, it reviles itself for so doing and now demands from philosophy not so much knowledge of what it is as the recovery through the, its agency of that lost sense of solid and substantial being. Philosophy is to meet this need not by opening up the fast-locked nature of, of substance and raising this up to self-consciousness, not by bringing consciousness out of its chaos back to an order based on thought, nor to the simplicity of the notion, but rather by running together what thought is put asunder by suppressing the differentiations of the notion and restoring the feeling of essential being. In short, by providing edification rather than insight. The beautiful, the holy, the eternal, religion and love are the bait required to arouse the desire to bite. Not the notion, but ecstasy. Not the cold march of necessity in the thing itself, but the ferment of enthusiasm. These are supposed to be what sustains and continually extends the wealth of substance. So section 7 continues this discussion in, in section 6 about intuition as a possible way to try to, to approach the absolute. And it begins by a little bit of history of ideas that you might not you know, exactly know where to locate. Um, so that's part of what I want to do from the start. He says spirit is gone past its substantial life in, in, in thought um, and he talks about a few modes in which this has taken place. And what Hegel's really talking about here is what's going on uh, in terms of changing consciousness in, in Europe. And some of this is economic, some of this is political, some of this is directly within the realm of, of philosophy and the development of the sciences, um, including those that, that deal with religion. So... Remember, what is substantial life? It's this sort of taken-for-granted, uh, almost natural attitude where, look, this is just the way things are, and a lot of things aren't being examined, aren't being questioned, they're, they're, they're being assumed. So some of the ways in which this was taking place, even in the realm of thought, was with what Hegel called the immediacy of faith. Um, if you think about Christian Europe and this conception of Christian Europe, that pervaded the Middle Ages. There were plenty of people who didn't believe, by the way. All you got to do is read, you know, some of the struggles that monks went through, or you know, read about um, some of the crazy stuff that went on among the laity of that time, and you realize that that you know the age of faith was not an age of universal faith. But if you wanted to begin from that sort of starting point, it was fairly unproblematic, as opposed to, you know once the Enlightenment had been going on for quite a while, and the erosion that took place because of that. Hegel also talks about the satisfaction and security of, con uh, of certainty that its consciousness had. So the, the thinker at the time of, um, even say, you know, Descartes or Hobbes, you know, boldly driving off on new paths, talking about, totally reforming philosophy from the ground up. Both of them, by the way, talked about doing that. Uh, and both of them actually did for the philosophy that they, they did. They're still actually marked to a certain extent, even as much as they, they engage in doubt, by a kind of satisfaction and security of certainty in, in, in what it is that they're able to, to think out. You know, um, Many other people, of course, are you know, not engaging in Descartes' hyperbolic doubt, 
and they get their categories of thought supplied to them, and they just work with those, and they think, yeah, these, these, these are what, these are it. This is what works. He also talks about a reconciliation with essential being and its presence inside and outside of us. What do we mean by this? Um, God, in the Middle Ages, humanity perhaps, if you abandon God, but you're still an optimistic person about human nature or something like that, the way a lot of Enlightenment materialist types were. Uh, I suppose even, you know, the, the realm of the libertines and pleasure could fit into this in a certain way. Uh, although they tend to be a little bit more morose. And Hegel will treat them a bit later on. So, why bring all this up? Because this isn't going to work anymore. I mean, you could go back to it if you want. But you're living a pipe dream, Hegel would say. The Enlightenment is not something you can turn back. Its corrosive effect upon human consciousness is not something that you can undo. To use an old expression, you can't unring that bell. So this has been lost. Now, not totally lost. There's still what Hegel calls the dry husks. Empty husks, he says. Um... Spirit is not only gone beyond all this into the other extreme of an insubstantial reflection. I need to put that down. Insubstantial reflection of itself into itself. Um, this is something very, very, very different. I can't stress that enough insubstantial. Human consciousness realizes its own lack of being the center of things, uh, that, it, that it can't necessarily rely on its own judgments as, as being what's truly real. Um, you know, Descartes would fit into this now to a certain extent in terms of, you know, what his doubt does. Um, De Sade would actually fit into this. All these, these other characters who are realizing Pascal as well, man is the thinking reed. Uh, reflection of itself into itself. Now, the, when we say this term reflection, we automatically think of mirrors. Hegel thinks of uh, reflection in two other ways, and so it's important to, to stress this at the beginning while we're sort of working on our main concepts. Um, you could think of it in terms of mirrors. You can also think of it as the act of reflection to thinking about something, right, which generates something new in the process. Um, and you can also think of reflection, and especially when it's this reflection of itself into itself, which is already marked by a kind of reflexivity, right, itself into itself, as a kind of movement, a movement of, of, of mind, a sort of folding back in upon itself. So, this is what spirit, or human consciousness, is reduced to. This is, this is to be quite alienated, to experience this, uh, as opposed to being in your, your substantial life, even if you're in a crappy position in, in the, the life world that you inhabit, you know, all you're doing is, is doing the menial jobs and being treated as if you're, you know, less than, than human. You still have some things you can take for granted, you still know where you fit. This is something quite different. And Hegel's not saying that this doesn't happen before the Enlightenment, but he thinks that it's not a widespread enough phenomenon for us to take notice of. Um, in the Enlightenment, though, it becomes... This is sort of the dark side of the Enlightenment. So he says, Spirit has lost its essential life, and it's conscious of this loss. It's conscious of the estrangement between substantial life, the way things used to be for it, which might be experienced you know, in childhood, and then you grow out of childhood, and now you're this alienated scholar or government employee, 
and you're, you're thinking to yourself, I, I don't know what the hell's going on anymore, and I don't know where I fit in. All I know is, I can't go back to that. What am I? Am I a thinking reed, like, like Pascal said? Am I a, sort of a combination of the greatest uh, misery and also the greatest, um, you know, heights that are there possible? I'm a paradox. This is, this is a, a, a real problem. This is something that one can feel anguish about. So he says, turning away from the empty husks and confessing that it lies in wickedness. This is also where the origin of a certain kind of conception of evil comes from. That it reviles itself for so doing and now demands from philosophy. So here's, here's what we need to think about. What do we demand from philosophy? What are we looking for philosophy to give us? Are we looking for it to be a self-help book? To use the parlance of our own time? Are we looking for it to shoot us off into the absolute? To teach us some, some tricks, some mindfulness stuff that'll, you know, zap us right there and we'll now feel A-OK -okay about no longer being alienated and we'll be back, maybe not in substantial life, but something even better, the absolute. He says, philosophy is to meet this need, this recovery of, through its agency, of the lost sense of solid and substantial being. Philosophy is to meet this need, and it can do it in two different ways. One is by conceptual knowledge, by the process that Hegel is himself outlining in the phenomenology, by the hard work, the patience and labor of the negative, to use a catchphrase that we're going to come to fairly soon in this, this uh, great work? Or does it attempt to do so through, through intuition? Um, he says, by running together what thought is put asunder by suppressing the differentiations of the notion and restoring the feeling of essential being. I don't want to think about this stuff. I just want to feel it. I don't want to be bothered with having to, you know, work my way through this stuff. That's not really the right stuff, man. You gotta, you gotta have your heart in the right place. That's the sort of thing that Hegel is criticizing here. Um, and he says, you know, all sorts of things work as traps for this. This is what he calls edification. Or do we want edification or do we want knowledge from philosophy? What are the traps or the baits? The beautiful, the holy, the eternal, religion, love. I would say in our own day, we could add some other words that are easier to relate to ourselves. Spirituality, the new age, mindfulness. All of those things for Hegel would be letting us down. Because here's the thing. When we ask, what do we demand from philosophy... Philosophy is a human activity. We're really asking, what do we demand from ourselves? Do we want to grow? Do we want to meet the absolute where it is by way of our own growth towards it? Which has to take place through systematic conceptual knowledge, through development, through philosophy. Or do we want to try to take shortcuts and feel like we're actually connected to the absolute or something that matters, something that puts everything in perspective, something that makes sense out of this admittedly crappy position to be in? That's the choice that he's outlining there. You may not have noticed that the first time that you read through this passage, but this is really a crux point. This is one of his main criticisms of the, you know, philosophy, if you want to call it that, of intuition. That it doesn't demand enough from philosophy and it doesn't demand enough from, from ourselves. 
In keeping with this demand is the strenuous, almost overzealous and frenzied effort to tear men away from their preoccupations with the sensuous, from their ordinary private affairs, and to direct their gaze to the stars, as if they had forgotten all about the divine and were ready like worms to content themselves with dirt and water. Formerly, they had a heaven adorned with a vast wealth of thoughts and imagery. The meaning of all that is hung on the thread of light by which it was linked to that heaven. Instead of dwelling in this world's presence, men looked beyond it, following this thread to an otherworldly presence, so to speak. The eye of the spirit had to be forcibly turned and held fast to the things of this world. And it has taken a long time before the lucidity, which only heavenly things used to have, could penetrate the dullness and confusion in which the sense of worldly things was enveloped. And so to make attention to the here and now as such, attention to what has been called experience. An interesting and valid enterprise. Now we seem to need just the opposite. Sense is no longer fast rooted in earthly things. Sense is so fast rooted in earthly things that it requires just as much force to raise it. The spirit shows itself as so impoverished that like a wanderer in the desert craving for a mere mouthful of water, it seems to crave for its refreshment only the bare feeling of the divine in general. By the little which now satisfies spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. In this next paragraph, section 8, Hegel is continuing to explore the, the mindset critically, he's going to criticize this, the mindset that demands that the absolute or reality or philosophy provide itself to the, the person in terms of intuition, in terms of something that would be graspable without having to put in a lot of time, work, labor, uh, or perhaps just labor of a certain kind. And there's a lot going on in this section, but I want to just stop and, and sort of contextualize it a bit. Hegel has been criticizing this, this point of view, and why? Well, because it's prevalent at his own time. Some of the, the thinkers that are going to be looked at by English and American authors as a transcendental philosophy, starting with Kant and then continuing through, are really going to be stressing this, this need to appeal to intuition. And as we pointed out before, this is not something radically new, Spinoza himself, with his third way of knowledge, Spinoza is really coming into vogue among authors at this time, um, after being in disrepute for <laughs> quite a while. He's emphasizing that, and there's there's other people too, you know, uh, the the mystic uh, Jakob Böhme, um, you know, I suppose you could say another mystic, Meister Eckhart as well, but you know, Nicholas of Cusa. There, there's many people out there talking about a higher form of of knowledge, and the question is. Is this going to be something that can be provided in terms of something like an intuitive leap away from the empirical, away from the historical, away from the everyday that we experience? Is it going to be something special that takes us into a, a starry beyond, to use Hegel's phrase? Or if we want to have what that's going to provide to us, because Hegel does think there is something there, does it have to kind of integrate itself with the realm that it seems to want to leave behind? That's the challenge that Hegel is, is posing in this, this section, and in, in the previous section where he was criticizing this appeal to intuition as well. So he's framing the way in which they see things, and in this section he's saying something that to a certain degree he endorses, but to a certain degree he is presenting merely to sort of put it out there as a incomplete position that will be taken up by his own position. So he says, in keeping with this demand, what's the demand that, that uh, the absolute be given in terms of intuition? is the strenuous, almost overzealous, and frenzied effort to tear men away from their preoccupation with the sensuous sensibility, uh, the ordinary private affairs, and to direct their gaze to the stars, to something that's higher, something that is more universal, away from the particular, 
towards the universal. And we have a, a antithesis being set up here, one that's uh, particularly acute in modernity after the Enlightenment, during the middle of the, the massive changes that are occurring within the economy with globalization, although they didn't know it was globalization quite yet, and the Industrial Revolution, uh, with new um, political forms, you know, this is soon after the French Revolution, after the American Revolution, after the, you know, developments in, in Britain, and there's interesting things going on in Germany. So there's this, there's a lot of ferment right now. And the question is, should people be paying attention to the world of the experiential, the empirical, which is also, to a certain extent, the, the private. My experience is my experience. I can only experience my portion. I can read about your experience, but I can't directly experience it. Um, should we focus just on, on the world, or should we look to what people had focused on before? And when you actually read, say, ancient history or medieval history, you find that, that the representations that moderns give of it are usually very... Uh, one-sided and, um, I won't say romantic, but romanticized. And the way that this views things is, you know, this is where people are focused today. This is where they used to be focused. They'd focus on the divine. They'd focus on what was beyond the world, what was metaphysical, what was eternal. They'd focus on what he calls... Uh, beautiful phrase here, a heaven adorned with a vast wealth of thoughts and imagery. So, you know, for an example of this, think of, if you've ever seen it, the, um, there's a beautiful icon in the, the Sloat Gallery at uh, Notre Dame University, and there's others, I believe, like this, and it shows... This icon depicts the orders of the angels in heaven. And so it's, it's depicting heaven as this dynamic liturgy where all these different things are going on and they're all interconnected and human beings themselves can play some sort of small role in this, where human beings are not really the center of the, let's say the universe, because even the universe isn't the center of the universe, if we mean by universe that which is most real, that which is ultimately grounding everything else, that which has the highest value. Um, now, that would be an example of what Hegel is calling this uh, heaven adorned with a vast wealth of thoughts and, and imagery. And like he says, you know, with this understanding of things, people will say, you know, ancient wisdom, or, you know, it was becoming quite popular to talk about medieval times at that time, uh, which, you know, medieval times, if you actually read the histories, <laughs> read the letters that people wrote, were actually quite secular. But there was this conception that people were more uh, attuned to the supernatural, to, to the beyond the worldly, to the transcendent back then, and... The real, the real task was to get them to actually pay attention to this stuff. This is a very modern conception of modernity, by the way. Uh, it's one that actually doesn't, doesn't fit the facts quite so well. And that's perhaps why Hegel is, is, is a little bit loath to endorse it entirely. And he does say that these, these other people are sort of projecting that as, as the, their raison d'etre for why, why their approach is the right approach. So he says, the eye of the spirit had to be forcibly turned and held fast to the things of this world. That's the, the force of secularization. It's taken a long time before the lucidity, which only heavenly things could have, could penetrate the dullness and confusion which the sense of worldly things was enveloped in, to pay attention to the here and now. And he says, this was, a, this was you know, a sort of progress, because now they're actually paying attention to uh, and he brings up this, this key word here, um, experience, the realm of experience, as opposed to the, the metaphysical, the, that which is beyond just mere experience. 
And so there's this movement away from that towards this, and now what we need is a, a counter movement back towards this. And so he says, um, now we seem to need just the opposite. Sense is so fast rooted in earthly things, it requires just as much force to raise it. The spirit shows itself so impoverished, and he's got this beautiful metaphor, that like a wanderer out in the desert who is craving a drink of water because they're actually, you know, dying of thirst, they will take anything that somebody puts in front of them. This is Hegel's criticism of these, these forms of, of philosophy or forms of culture that are making appeals to intuition, that they're basically um, just a cup of water or who knows what being offered to the thirsty traveler who is spirit, who actually needs both sides of these. Um, Spirit has been lacking this so much in the, the secularized, modernizing world that it will take just about anything that offers itself as that without, without being critical, without actually seeing whether it really is the divine, whether it really is representing something metaphysical, something transcendent or not. Um, and Hegel sees this as a, a real problem, so he says, by the little which set now satisfies spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. So we see the discussion of loss and estrangement that took place in paragraph 7 being used now to talk about why people are willing to jump into, to take sort of a, if we want to use a Kierkegaardian phrase, a leap of faith into some sort of super sensible beyond. And the last thing to say about this is that this is really a, a problematic that is coming about because of, of how not just other thinkers, but especially Immanuel Kant has framed things. You know, there is a sort of scission running through. This is the world that we can actually have knowledge about, the empirical. This is what science can actually deal with. This is the realm of metaphysics, and theoretical metaphysics for Kant really can't do much of anything. Uh, in the practical world, well, in the practical side of this, rather, uh, where we're dealing with practical reason and ethics, there we can actually, we can make a bit more progress, there's a bit more traction, but none of this is, strictly speaking, knowable. And there's really no back and forth between these available after Kant does his work. And so you might say what Hegel's doing here is he's seeing where the Kantian problematic goes to, and then he's going to try to get past it. This modest complacency in receiving, or this sparingness in giving, does not, however, befit science. Whoever seeks mere edification, whoever wants to shroud and amiss the manifold variety of his earthly existence and of thought in order to pursue the indeterminate enjoyment of this indeterminate divinity, may look where he wishes to find all this. He will find ample opportunity to dream up something for himself. But philosophy must beware of the wish to be edifying. So Hegel concludes this passage by saying, philosophy must beware of the wish to be edifying. And why is that? Well, as you're going to realize, edification and edifying are dirty words in the phenomenology. They're, they're what philosophy oftentimes gets reduced to, and thereby becomes less than philosophy. And Hegel wants to avoid that like the plague. Um, another word for edifying would be upbuilding. Or, you know, think about the, the, the notion that we have that you often see in a lot of contemporary education, that we're supposed to meet the learner not only where they are, but where they're comfortable, and then, you know, try to bring them a little bit closer. And if we can't get them all the way, well, that's okay, because we made a little bit of progress. That's what edification means. That's one way to sort of wrap your head around it. And... What Hegel's criticizing, still in this passage, he's still talking about these, these views on, on philosophy that reduce it to um, trying to train our intuition to be able to grasp something, something divine, something transcendent, something supersensible, 
and leave behind the, the empirical world. Um, the problem is that gets very, very hazy. Like he said in, in the passage just before this, it's like somebody who's so thirsty that they'll take anything that you offer them to drink and they'll be satisfied with it because they're getting something at least. And that's what happens with edification. It's a matter of, he talks about complacency. I like to frame this in terms of low expectations. Um, now, that's not to say that we automatically ought to have super high expectations that can't possibly be met of philosophy. I actually run across this many times uh, in my videos where viewers are looking for something to be made totally clear for them, which can't really be made totally clear for them because it requires some, some involvement, some effort on their part, some careful reading quite often. I see this with a lot of students as well. Uh, people want to say, what's your definition of this? And you know, real philosophy doesn't proceed by, by starting with definitions and then, you know, proceeding deductively, you know, uh, to, to produce arguments. That, that's sort of a, that's a, a story that we tell people about philosophy, that as soon as you start reading a lot of real philosophy, you realize, well, that was, that was a great oversimplification, to use Wittgenstein's uh, analogy. That's sort of like... Um, doing calculations about how things are going to go without taking into account air resistance. Um, the, the air resistance is there because it's real. And there's a lot more thought resistance than there is air resistance. Going back to this, so having low expectations about what philosophy ought to provide, about what it is that we're trying to do when we're, we're using our minds. Because remember, philosophy for Hegel is this, this totalizing activity that has to become completely scientific, completely systematic. It is going to literally encompass everything. That's what I mean by totalizing. It's going to take in the totality and make it intelligible. That's a much higher expectation than, well, it'll give me something I can believe so I can wake up each day and feel a little bit better about myself. Or... Um, It'll give me something that I can chat about with other people and have some common ground. Or, and we can pick a number of different uh, lowered expectations about philosophy. In this case, the lowered expectation is that, well, it'll give me something. It's not something really clear or something that I, I can wrap my head around too easily, but something that'll like, get me on the path to intuition, something that'll sound cool, something that'll sound kind of mystical, if we want to put it in, in contemporary terms. And, you know, that, that's attractive to a lot of people. Um, Hegel thinks that that's, on the part of the person receiving, that's a matter of low expectations. On the part of the one giving, uh, it's a form of stinginess. You're not actually giving people enough to go on. You're not actually providing them with something that they can really sink their teeth into and if we want to continue that metaphor, not only find some meat, but draw some blood and some sustenance from it. So the giving, the receiving, the philosopher, the, the culture that's taking that in uh, and producing other philosophers in turn who are also going to be equally stingy in giving. I mean, Hegel would not only be willing to say this about this kind of fuzzy, duzzy, mystical, intuition-based philosophy. I think he'd be willing to say that about a lot of other forms of philosophy as well. Um, if he were around today and looking at contemporary analytic philosophy, that would actually fit this bill as well, because the expectations are so low, the horizons are so low, that you can't actually fit anything really substantive and, and interesting and historically based in it. And it tends to produce people who are rather stingy and giving, um, and, you know, when they teach philosophy, they often turn people off from philosophy. Same thing would go, by the way, for a lot of continental philosophy, which tends to be just oriented around critique or cultural studies or things like that. They've lost a sense of the whole, of the totality, of the whole business of philosophy. So there's, there's one other thing that he says in here that I think is important. He says, whoever seeks mere edification, which is what we're talking about here, and wants to shroud and amiss the manifold variety of this, his earthly existence and of thought. So Hegel is saying that edification, what it's missing, is the variety of 
experience and thought. It's not doing justice to our actual lived experience as human beings. And by the way, part of our experience includes being thinking beings. And part of that experience includes running into thoughts that other people already thought before you and articulated and that are waiting there like, you know, a bounty for you to actually latch onto and start exploring. That's part of what's being left out by this way of doing philosophy that has low expectations and sort of stinginess and giving. That merely edifies without doing real philosophy. And he finishes here by saying, in order to pursue the indeterminate enjoyment of this indeterminate divinity, they can look where they, they like to find all this. Why? Because they'll find ample opportunity to dream up something for themselves. So if, if this is your model for philosophy, that it's really just edification, and that it's going to be based on, you know, this, this, this sort of lack on this side and a lack on this side that reinforce each other, why do people like that? Well, because it leaves them free to dream, to daydream. Not to dream in the sense of, you know, creative dreaming where they're actually, you know, sketching out what they're going to do. Something that would actually be, do some justice to, to this incredible world that we live in and these incredible beings that we are. But rather to do the kind of hazy, I just kind of like this idea and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explore it. I'm going to ride my hobby horse, in the old sense of it. Um, it lends itself to any sort of desire, any sort of motif or theme that one would like, just so long as one allows it to remain kind of hazy and doesn't question it and doesn't expect any rigor from it. As soon as one starts to do that, it falls apart. That's why edification doesn't satisfy because edification doesn't go far enough. Edification does not provide us with the rigor that real philosophy ought to.